reason that internal desire for learning has to come from. It has to come from within you. The lack of personal relevance. This is one that I have seen a lot, especially as a teacher. A lot of times students aren't really motivated if they can't see why what they're learning is relevant in the real world. Personally, I never had a problem with this because I always loved mathematics simply for the sake of loving mathematics. It is a beautiful subject and I love it dearly. You need to find something that you love and I think that will make a big difference. Also remember that whenever you're trying to learn something new and you're in a classroom setting, you're only going to learn certain things because those are the things that are supposed to be taught for whatever reason. And there's only a certain amount of time in a classroom to learn those things. That's why self-study is so great because you can learn other stuff on your own and it really helps you become better in the classroom and out of the classroom and it helps you learn more information. Inadequate sleep and self-care. This is one that is huge and I think most people don't think about it. I have known students that study all the time. They sleep six hours a night and they do really well, but eventually they get to a point where they burn out. It is not good. The smartest guy I ever knew was extremely balanced and he took care of himself. He would show up to class, he would bring his food, and he would eat food in class. He would sit there with a knife and a fork and eat some delicious smelling food, and he always finished his homework, and he always got A's. Mr. Perfect. I always strived to be like him, but I was never able to get there. So you want to try to be like him. You want to emulate those people who seem to be perfect, those people who seem to have a good head on their shoulders, are always on time, they're always doing homework, they're never stressed, and they're always doing awesome. That's who you want to be like. And I think self-care is a big part of that. Make sure you get enough sleep. Make sure you get enough exercise. Make sure you get some social time. Remember, life is about balance. I made this video because I know how hard it is to learn something new. I know how hard it is to learn mathematics. I've studied mathematics for a long time, and I've seen a lot of students who study mathematics, and I've seen how they study, I've seen the things they do, I've seen how they struggle, and I've seen the mistakes they make. Hopefully after watching this video, you can learn from it, and you can do better, you can be more successful, and you can have a better life. Good luck to you. And if you have any advice for anyone, receiving the money that I want to in my bank account every month. You change your thought process, your reticular activating system through neuroscience. Repetition will literally show you evidence around you and people, places, and events to prove your new belief system is real. Peace and riches and blessings. I am Michael B. Beckwith, the host of Take Back Your Mind. <laughs> keep some kind of relationship while still respecting my own boundaries. Now, your answer is kind of already within your question there. 
Can you keep a relationship that, that keeps your boundaries? What you're saying is you're going to move into this relationship with no expectations. The individual has already told you you're not socially available. And for whatever reason, maybe there's some trauma, you can't see yourself cut deal with areas of their life in which they're not available to have any intimate relationship. So remember the old saying that you believe someone until you see their eyes or where they are in the moment. So believe this individual. If they say they're not emotionally available, believe that. And definitely keep your boundaries. But maybe walk very slowly in terms of a relationship. They've already told you they're not available. So maybe it's just an acquaintanceship. Maybe it is just a surface of friendship because they're not emotionally available for anything else. Oftentimes people make the mistake of thinking, oh, I'm going to go into this relationship and I'm going to help change that other person. I'm going to help heal that other person. No, that's their job to enter into some type of spiritual awareness, spiritual practice. Sometimes we say ageless wisdom. So she's bringing us into an awareness of this ageless wisdom. And
what what the shit Enough to start them off. While Steve's eating some gummies, Francis asks him whether he can have the green ones, and Steve claims to hate green ones. Inside the house, half of them go to the basement, which is where Martha is, and half of them go to Richard's room. Entering the room, they start firing at a window when Francis comes through the opposite one. He takes out of the guys that work for the brothers, leaving just the two of them. While Vaughn's struggling with the automatic gun, Francis decides to help him. Pulling the trigger and setting the gun, he asks Vaughn if he wants it back, so as he reaches for the gun, Francis shoots his foot. Richard tries to grab the gun, but Francis grabs it before him and pointing it at him asks where Martha is. Richard claims that he doesn't know, so Francis puts the gun down, saying that he will find her himself. Not ending in the way he wanted, Vaughn asks Francis to stop and try to eliminate Richard. Both Francis and Richard stare at him confused, and it frustrates him even more. He tells Francis to do the thing he always does when someone tries to hire him to murder someone, but Francis reveals that he has promised his girlfriend to never do it again. Francis goes on about how meeting her has changed his life and tries to get his opinion as well, but Vaughn asks to spare him and murder his brother the way he's supposed to. More confused than ever, Francis puts the gun down and leaves the room so the brothers can talk. Of course, the situation escalates as the brothers run to grab the gun. Vaughn fires at his brother and after a couple of bullets, murders him. Going into another room, Francis is met by Bruce who tries to attack him with the gun but is soon taken away from him. However, Bruce doesn't give up as he shows him his karate skills. Not knowing karate, Francis promises not to use the gun if he doesn't use karate, but he is met with a kick to his nose once he puts the guns down. They fight for a little when Francis grabs his gun once again. However, Bruce accidentally grabs a bomb and takes the chip out of it. Petrified, he stares at Francis looking for an answer, so Francis gets closer to him. Taking the bomb in his hand, he makes sure that it's safe before putting it aside. As he starts a conversation with Bruce, Steve appears out of nowhere with a sniper to Francis's head. Francis claims that he has only come to get his girlfriend, so he puts his weapons to the ground. Steve thinks for a while but finally lets Francis go as he claims to like him more than his bosses. After searching for a hole, he finally finds the correct room and is more than happy to see his girlfriend there. He greets her and takes her tape off. Walking slowly out of the building, they are careful not to run into any unwanted people. They get distracted by their conversation when all of a sudden something hits Francis and that sends him flying down the stairs. Behind Martha appears Hopper with a gun in his hand. Francis is left to fight Hopper while Martha gets taken away. As Johnny's pointing a gun at her, she walks backward and slips on the blood there. As she's on the ground, he kneels and admits that it reminds him of his bully and what he used to do to him. Not having the power to fight him back, he took his anger out on his poor turtle as a way of hurting him. Getting his jacket off, he's ready to slash Martha into pieces, but due to her reflexes, she's able to dodge every hit. By the end of the fight, she punches Johnny so hard that he falls to the ground, giving her a great chance to take the knife and stab him. And so she does, while claiming that she loves turtles. While Francis is strongly fighting with Hopper, he does get a couple of hits that send him flying to the ground. Hopper admits that he's not angry at him but rather disappointed so much so, that he plans to take him to a desert, dose him up with something really special, and reprogram his brain. Too late for that is what Francis says before standing up and revealing that they're handcuffed together. Martha runs into another issue as Vaughn comes in front of her with a gun pointed at her face. He asks where Johnny is and she reveals that she killed him and that he is next. They start arguing and Vaughn accidentally pulls the trigger and shoots the side of Martha's head. She takes his shock as an opportunity to grab the gun and shoot his hand. He starts crying in pain, so she hits him with a couple of bullets to finally take him down. I am a T-Rex, I am invincible is all she says before going to find Francis. As they're laying on the ground, Francis and Hopper point their guns to each other's faces. Hopper calls Francis a psychopath and asks him whether he thinks that he would easily walk out of that life and settle down. He makes sure to remind him that he'll never be normal, so Francis shoots the handcuffs, releasing him from the grip. Hopper calls out for him to come back, but Francis continues forwards, saying that no one wants to be normal. 
Hopper tries to shoot him from the back, but he gets taken out by Steve. Francis is delighted to see Steve and lets him know that he'll be rich since Hopper's worth $5 million. Steve passes him the bag of gummies and Francis heads to the doors right as Martha's coming out of them. She lets him know that she has taken two bad guys down and he is proud of her. They share some gummies before heading to the hospital. We are taken two months later in northern Vietnam. Francis takes two bowls in which jalapeno is for Thailand and lime is for Brazil. She picks jalapeno and gets excited because she wanted to go there in the first place. Despite being far from New Orleans, they're still being followed and we see a guy in a truck with a sniper. As he's looking through the peephole, he sees Francis writing on something. And once he lifts the plate, it says where's the girl. The guy panics and lets his colleagues know that he has lost contact with the girl. But looking up, he sees Martha and all she says is what are you looking at before shooting him. Things go smoothly for Martha and Francis as it seems like two weirdos have found each other. In Chicago, America, a homeless was seen when suddenly, a lot of money fell from the sky. Turned out, a robber had just broken into the building, taken some money with him, and tried to escape from there in a very acrobatic way. He strapped himself with a rope and run down the building's wall. After he managed to land his foot on land, he immediately took a bike he had prepared and left from there at a very high speed. His above-average riding skill made the police officers that tried to catch him overwhelmed. Despite all the obstacles in traffic, the robber managed to escape from the police officers that were chasing him. The police tried to corner him in a building, but the robber did something unimaginable. He shot a rope that connected the building to the nearest building and rode his bike on the rope to get away. Finally, he managed to disappear from the police's surveillance and returned to the headquarters to plan his next action. It was Sawyer Khan. The robber who was also the owner of a circus group called the Great Indian Circus who is currently holding auditions to find female personnel, although so far he has not found the right person to fill the position. When the audition committee was about to close the registration, suddenly a woman who rode a bicycle appeared, intending to show her talent in front of everyone. A woman named Aaliyah, who had a beautiful and exotic face, stunned Sawyer and made Sawyer let her show her talent on stage. Somewhere in India, a man named Ali was seen hanging in the middle of the market by some thugs who were known to be drug dealers. He was hanged because he was caught sneaking around and one of the thugs caught him. Suddenly, his friend, ACP Giant Dixit, a police officer, showed up very dramatically while driving a rickshaw. Ali immediately got into the rickshaw so he could quickly escape from that place. The thug tried to catch them but Jai's fighting skills made the thugs overwhelmed and helped them escape from there. After managing to escape from the thugs, Jai was contacted by Detective Victoria from America for help in solving a robbery case. Western Bank of Chicago was robbed by someone who left Hindi letters and a mask. Of course, Jai felt challenged and immediately went to America with Ali to catch the robber. As soon as they arrived in Chicago, Jai and Ali met with the head of the bank named Mr. Anderson. Jai immediately asked whether they had fired any employees this year or if maybe the bank had a sworn enemy. Jai believed that the robbery was a motive for revenge because the robber only broke into the same bank twice. With various considerations, Jai decided to provoke the robber by challenging him so that the robber can reappear. Sure enough, Sire who watched the news was triggered to do something about it. Sire then deliberately met Jai. Long story short, Sire went to the police station to meet Jai and claimed to be the owner of the Great Indian Circus. He said that the culprit of the robbery was one of his former employees who was dressed in a clown costume. Sawyer was sure that he would do another robbery at the same bank again. Sawyer also offered cooperation by helping to provide information so the police could catch the robber alive. He believed that his former employee was not entirely wrong. After hearing an explanation from Sawyer, Jai agreed and told him to meet at the bank the next day. Sawyer purposely did that to trick Jai and entered the bank with the aim of taking the building's plan, the access code, and the evacuation route. After successfully getting all the information, Sire immediately contacted Jai to inform him that the clown was expected to do his action. It turned out that he purposely did that to prove to the police that he could never be caught. After receiving the information, Jai immediately mobilized police from all directions to guard the bank. Several hours passed but the suspect never showed up. When Ollie was on standby in front of the building, suddenly thousands of dollars were blown by the wind from above. Sire had successfully broken into the bank. After realizing what happened, Jai immediately told all the police officers to catch the robber. Sire fled using a motorbike, passing several traps from the police. He hit the gas until Ollie was overwhelmed to keep up with Sire's riding skills, although when he arrived at a bridge, surprisingly the police had blocked the road. Finally, Sire decided to jump into the river. 
It turned out that Sawyer's motorbike was equipped with super technology because it could turn into a speedboat. Jai immediately intervened by borrowing a small boat parked under the lake and told Ollie to block Sawyer in the water, but when Ollie tried to block his way, Sawyer used his speedboat to jump out of the water and pass Ollie's boat from the air. Meanwhile, Jai rushed to catch up with Sawyer, but somehow, Sawyer jumped out of the water and turned his speedboat back to a bike and hit the gas to escape from there. Jai hadn't given up yet. He got a helicopter while carrying a gun so he could immobilize Sawyer immediately. While chasing Sawyer using the helicopter, Jai managed to land a shot at Sawyer's shoulder and almost made him fall off his bike, but sadly, Sawyer went into a tunnel and managed to escape the chase. From this incident, Jai and Ollie went straight to Sawyer's hideout because they believed that he was the real culprit. After the show finished, without much fuss, Jai immediately approached Sawyer and took off Sawyer's clothes to check on his shoulder to check the gunshot wound on his shoulder using a scanner-like tool, but surprisingly, they didn't manage to find the slightest wound on Sawyer's shoulder. That made Jai confused. Knowing that Jai had left, Sawyer immediately went downstairs to rest after a day of show. When he looked in a mirror, surprisingly, another person without any slightest difference from him showed up. It turned out that Sawyer has a twin brother. The one that Jai shot during the chase was Sawyer's twin brother, whose name is Samar. Sawyer had been hiding Samar's identity. They had their own duties to trick the police so they could take revenge on Mr. Anderson. Back when Sawyer and Samar were 12 years old, their father named Iqbal Khan experienced a financial crisis because his circus was not selling well. He made a decision to borrow money from the Western Bank of Chicago which was managed by Mr. Anderson, but it turned out that Iqbal could not pay his debts until Mr. Anderson confiscated the circus building which was collateral, and because he was unable to deal with the problems, Iqbal decided to end his life in front of Sawyer and Samar. From that incident, they vowed to take revenge on Mr. Anderson by robbing the Western Bank of Chicago so he could feel the loss that destroyed their future. It was discovered that Samar had autism since childhood and his father had been hiding him in backstage. Samar, who is different from his older brother, actually has deep feelings for Aaliyah, the newest member of the circus. Her smile made his heart beat so fast. He wanted to express his love, but he decided not to do it. He chose to pour out his heart in a diary. Meanwhile, Jai who felt very embarrassed because he couldn't catch the robber intended to return to India and wanted to forget this case, but Ollie insisted that Jai could finish his job because not a single criminal could escape from his ambush. Finally, Jai regained his motivation and decided to continue his goal of capturing the robber. Jai suspected Sire of hiding something because it was impossible for him to recover in just a short time after getting shot. Jai then decided to investigate Sire's circus. He disguised himself as a technician officer to reveal the secret behind all this. When he followed Sire, he finally found out about Samar, Sire's twin brother. Jai began to find a bright spot regarding the secret that Sire had been hiding. Jai put together a strategy to immobilize them in a way that cannot be predicted by them. Sometime later, Jai began his mission by following Samar. He knew that Samar regularly went out of the circus to the amusement park from Detective Victoria. Jai acted by pretending to be homeless to attract Samar's attention, and sure enough, after Jai did the scheme, Samar finally fell into a trap. Jai finally befriended Samar. He was also invited by Samar to ride all the rides and spend the time playing until the afternoon. When it was late in the afternoon, Samar decided to return home because the bus that would pick him up would arrive soon. Samar was happy because it was the first time he had fun with a friend. All this time, he had been forbidden to have friends by his older brother, because that could mess up the plans that had been prepared all along. He promised to meet Jai next week so they could spend their time together again. The next day Sawyer went to the bank disguised as an old man and intended to rob the bank for the last time so that Mr. Anderson's shares would decline, making the bank bankrupt and their revenge will be avenged. One week passed and as usual, Samar went to the amusement park to meet Jai. Before trying the rides, Jai suddenly mentioned Aliyah. All of a sudden Samar, who heard this immediately confided in Jai that he really liked Aliyah. From there, Jai started his plan by scapegoating Samar and Sawyer by saying that Aliyah had feelings for Sawyer. This made Samar jealous of Sawyer and he immediately went home feeling angry. Samar immediately asked to switch roles while acting on stage with Sawyer because he felt bored performing backstage. Sawyer started to get confused about why Samar behaved like that and immediately agreed to his wish. After finishing the show, Aliyah, who was holding Samar's hand, made his heart beat so fast. Aliyah immediately asked Samar out on a date, knowing that he also had the same feelings for her. Before going on his date with Aliyah, Samar went to his room to change his clothes. 
Sauter started to question what happened. Selmar said that he wanted to live freely like other people in general and love women the way normal people do. The two argued until Sauter started reminding him that their purpose in coming to America was to destroy the bank that had made his father die. Samar insisted to meet Aliyah, which triggered Sire's anger. Sire slapped Samar. Samar was irritated and just left from there without a single word to say. Meanwhile, Sire just stood there, unable to do anything, and regretted slapping his brother. A few hours after they started their date, Samar took Aliyah to the station because she had to go home. Samar was surprised because suddenly, Aliyah brought her face closer and the two finally kissed. Meanwhile, at the police station, Jai invited Mr. Anderson and intended to provide information that the perpetrator of the robbery was the son of Iqbal, whose life was destroyed because the bank had confiscated his circus building 25 years ago. Jai was sure that the attempts of robbery before were revenge missions so his bank went bankrupt. Jai asked the Chicago police to act immediately to stand by at the bank. Before acting, Jai first met with Samar intending to ask him to leave his brother because he had been set as a bolo. The goal was to save Samar because he believed he was only being used by his brother, but it turned out that when Jai walked away, the person that Jai thought was Samar turned out to be Sire who disguised himself as his brother to find out the purpose of Jai. He suspected something had happened to his brother and decided to follow him. He then found out about Jai. Sire then decided to tie Jai to the rail of a ride in the amusement park for him to die, but luckily, Ali secretly followed Jai because he felt something bad would happen. Ali immediately untied the ropes that tied Jai's hands and feet so he could save his life. After letting go of the ropes, Jai immediately ordered the squad team to surround the bank so that Sire and Samar wouldn't have a chance to escape from there, but suddenly, when the officers entered the lobby of the building, toxic gas leaked out of the ventilation so that all officers were forced to come out. Seeing there was a faint chance, Samar and Sire immediately intended to run away and destroy the name of the bank using a bomb. Then they immediately took their bike to escape. Jai and Ali also immediately took their bikes so they could chase the two robbers. During the chase, Samar and Sire parted ways at the T-junction to trick the police officers who were chasing them. They believed that this method would be more effective in outwitting Jai, Ali, as well as the other police officers. When they entered an intersection, they finally succeeded in escaping the police cars by making them crash. They then split up again to lure Jai and Ali to split up too. When Jai and Sire arrived on a deserted road, they immediately got into a battle. Jai was forced to give in because it turned out that Sire dominated the fight. Fortunately, Sire still let him still live. Sire then left from there after he managed to paralyze Jai. He immediately tried to find his younger brother who was still being chased by Ali. Jai immediately got up and chased Sire and Samar with the help of Ali who quickly helped him. Sire made the decision to run away by using a fishing boat so that the two policemen could not chase them. But suddenly, Jai and Ali desperately hit the gas and jumped to reach the boat. Sire was asked to surrender because the Chicago police had surrounded them at sea and on land and there was no chance to escape, but suddenly, Sire pressed a secret button so that the bike he was riding on could merge with his younger brother's motorbike. Finally, Sire and Samar managed to escape by combining their two motorbikes and jumping away from the boat. The next day, Jai found out that Sire and Samar were going to pass the biggest dam in America to run away. Jai then took Aliyah to persuade Samar to give up. Knowing they were cornered, Sire negotiated so that Jai won't put his brother in prison. He offered to give all his crime information in exchange for his brother's freedom. After Jai agreed, Sire approached Samar and told him that he was free to do everything he wanted and that he would live happily with Aliyah. Suddenly, Sire attempted to jump off the dam to end his life because he didn't want to end up in prison. Thankfully, Samar grabbed his brother's arm in time. Samar didn't want to let go of Sire's hand. He had promised his father not to let go of his brother under any circumstances, even though he knew that his life would not be as normal as usual. Samar finally decided to jump with his brother to run away from all the problems that were chasing them. Jai regretted the decision that Samar and Sire had taken for doing such an unforgivable sin. After that incident, they immediately went to Mr. Anderson. His bank had gone bankrupt after the last robbery. science behind it so that what if you could take it back your mind you could change your life you may have seen her on bbc new york times wealth insider marie claire harper's bazaar business insider vogue forbes usa today many other top ranked publications 
She's the creator of the renowned Motivational Behavior Synchronicity Method, MBS. For short, does it stand for Michael Bentley Superstar? <laughs> <laughs> that stands for Meditational Behavior Synchronicity, which helps you to remove self-limiting beliefs and become a powerful creator in your own reality. And it's the secret formula to conscious success. We're going to get into that in a moment because she has a powerful story. She's the host of the Law of Attraction podcast, which has gained over 100 million streams and is ranked in the top 10 podcasts to download in 2021 by Influence Magazine. And she's the author of her upcoming book. I think it's out now, right? It's out now. You better get it. Be it until you become it. The Law of Attraction explained through neuroscience, ancient wisdom, which we are going to discuss right now. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. God, what an intro. What a special place to be. This is an amazing podcast, and I am so excited to get into it with you. I'm so glad. Now, many people, I mean, there's millions of people who know you are, particularly in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. You're now here in Los Angeles with me. Uh huh. So I want everyone to know a little bit about your backstory. I mean, is it true that approximately five years ago you were actually homeless? know it's it's a wild story i've built very fast i've manifested the life of my dreams and changed my life very very quickly here i am today but it's not my where i began right. where i began was totally i mean i had no money i was constantly destroying myself self-sabotaging ended up as a single mom yeah we ended up going to the street i ended up with nothing because i self-sabotaged my world around me got myself into debt got myself into a messy situation and boom you don't own anything you don't have anything to your name and all of a sudden you are left with nothing but from that place i decided i'm not gonna stay here there is no way this is my destiny there is no way in this space is where i'm meant to be i'm meant to be somewhere greater the source god the universe whatever you call it has something bigger for me right. and i knew i had to take back what's mine Outstanding. So you made a choice. Mm -hmm. There was something that happened to you mm -hmm. internally mm -hmm. where you decided this was not the life you were destined to live. There was another life trying to emerge. I mean, tell us about that internal process. I know we're going to, you synthesize it in your book to a degree, mm -hmm. but oftentimes people think that they're helpless. Mm -hmm. They think that, oh, that's just fate. Mm -hmm. Oh, that condition can determine my life. But something happened within you. You made a choice. A choice, and that is where it begins. I made a conscious decision to change my life. I made a conscious decision that I was not going to stay left and forgotten and ignoring what was really going on. I decided internally, as you say, I internalized it. I used what was within me to realize that what was around me comes from within. Mm -hmm. So everything you see in out of reality is a direct reflection of your inner self-beliefs. And I knew I have to work on me. Because this is not someone else's fault. Because when I point a finger and I say, you're the problem, look at this. One, two, three fingers are pointing back to me. Who's the problem? Right. So I knew I have to do something different. I'm listening to wonderful things. I'm reading great things, but I'm not applying them. Application. Application. Practice. That's what changed. Uh -huh. You have you made a decision, and then you went into application. Yes. Now, this, this is very important, what you're saying, because many of you may have been seminars, you may have read books, but are you actually applying what you have read? Are you going to apply what you read in this book? That's that's that and you synthesize a lot of your your technologies. You know, what do you want the audience to take away from this book? I want them to know that be it until you become is about you becoming the version of you before you get there. You don't have to wait till you're a multi-millionaire to give to charity. You don't have to be healthy once you are healthy. It is all about becoming the version of you in your mind before you get there. Fake it till you make it. It doesn't exist. You don't want to live fake it till you make it. You don't want to fake being it. You don't want to be second place to somebody else. You want to be first place to yourself. Right. You want to become the version of you before you get there. So you're, you're actually inviting people. We both do this a lot. You're inviting people to feel it mm -hmm. even before there's any physical manifestation mm -hmm. or evidence of it. Mm -hmm. Just, Just apply the teachings 
get into the feeling tone of health, prosperity, generosity, yes. happiness, yes. even before there's any evidence. That's a little difficult for many people. Uh huh, and it is. And there's science to back it up. Yeah. There's a, I'll give you some neuroscience here. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system, okay? In the lower part of your brain, it filters 2 million bits of data every second colors, sounds, things that you see. And it shows you anything that you deem as important. So, what do you deem as important? Well, anything that you focus your mind on is what it deems as important. So if you're focusing your mind on, I am unworthy, I'm never going to make money. Oh, I'm, I'm never going to meet the love of my life. Yeah, I'm stuck in this situation at work. It's never going to get better. Then, of course, your reticular activating system is going to show evidence around you to prove right. that belief system is real. Right. So change it. Right. Decide. Yeah, okay, it may not be true that I'm a multimillionaire. It may not be true that I'm prosperous right now, that I'm healthy, that I'm abundant, that I'm in love, that I'm any one of these feelings, but if I decide in my mind, I am loved, I am in a harmonious relationship, I am receiving the money that I want to in my bank account every month, you change your thought process, your reticular activating system through neuroscience, repetition will literally show you evidence around you of people, places, and events to prove your new belief system is right. <laughs> You're listening to Natasha Graziano. <laughs> Look at this. Be it until you become. You can feel her passion. You can feel her, her energy. She's embod embodied this. Now, I want to ask you about this book because it's in, um, in your chapter in the subconscious mind. And you said, believing that wealth is merely an external aspect is completely untrue because it only involves the physical aspect of generating money. Now, there's a lot in that state. You're saying, this is what I'm getting. Many people think that, that, that first of all, wealth is external. And they think they have to do a lot of external things. But you're talking about something else as well. You got it. Well, I remember writing this, and I, and I remember where it came from. It was internalizing and understanding that I was really packing a bag. Okay, I was I was packing my son's toys mm. into a big black trash liner, and I was sitting in, in this apartment. We're about to check out of the next day, 11 a.m. to nowhere, by the way, to nowhere. No, no. Wait, I want to no, I want to stop right there. You were checking out and had nowhere to go. I want you to hear that. She had nowhere to go. She was checking out and had nowhere to go. Many of you can relate to that. You're back on the wall. You don't know what you're going to do. There's some kind of issue in your life, but you have no answer to it. So the reason why I'm bringing that up, because we're not dealing with airy-fairy concepts here. We're dealing with real-life issues and that she actually went through a real-life issue to be able to sit here today continue okay so now I'm, I'm packing the bag and I'm looking around and I'm thinking where are we going and I remember thinking I don't have a dime to my name I can't even afford a hostel for me and my son tomorrow where am I going and I remember knowing I, I don't have any money but it doesn't matter whether it's true or not whether I have money it's what I believe mm -hmm. so if I believe right now that I can get out of this, that I can heal, that I'm going to have money, that I they do have money, even though it doesn't feel like it, mm -hmm. I'm going to still give $2 to a homeless person mm -hmm. I'm, uh, who's really homeless, homeless, mm -hmm. like on the street, sleeping on the street. I am not going to stay there. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I did. Mm -hmm. And here we are today. Now, one of the key things in your book, and I think anybody who has a heart Yes. Are on the path of heart, yes. always deals with this one word, forgiveness. Absolutely. Key. And you really have a wonderful articulation in your book about it. Why is that so important? Forgiveness is the cure, I believe, to everything. It's the cure to so many problems that anyone faces in their life. It's the solution to wars it's the, the solution and the cure to so many things we hold in our body because whatever we hold inside of us is then externalized through our pores through right. disease when your body is not at ease in yourself right and right. i know you know you you teach this so magically and perfectly so when we are holding on to something it is actually scientifically proven resentment to cause ailments in your body. There's a scientific study in my book talking about this from I think Dr. Nina Ratcliffe, if I've got that right. And you will hold on to things. And if you hold on to things, you will create more chaos in your yeah. life, more problems, your immunity goes down. But when you choose today, as simple as this, to let go 
-hmm. just to let go today of one thing mm -hmm. that you're holding on to maybe something that you're not forgiving yourself for or mm -hmm. maybe something you're not forgiving someone else for you today just decide I'm gonna let go I'm gonna forgive myself or them or both for that situation event thing that happened and guess what do you know how light you feel mm -hmm. after do you know how free you feel after you can go about your day and it doesn't mean that you are forgetting what happened to Absolutely. you Absolutely. it doesn't mean you're forgetting i was sexually abused twice in my teens and in my 20s and i do not look at that and think i've, I've forgiven them yes but it doesn't mean i've forgotten it doesn't mean if i see them i have to hug them in the street you can see them from afar you can love them from afar you can even forget them from afar you don't even have to know them mm -hmm. still be afar but forgiveness we hold on to resentment they don't hold on because the person or the thing that happened to you they get on with their life right and we are the ones that right. hold it inside of us right one of the things that i say is that holding a grudge is heavy lifting yes you're, you're holding a vibration in a frequency of unforgiveness resentment yeah. animosity yeah. And those frequencies, those thought forms, yes. as you just taught us, replicate themselves. Yes. They show up in our life as symptoms, as moods, as blocking of experiences, yes. and we're doing it. And so oftentimes people will say, well, I'm a good person, and, but you know what? These are laws we're dealing with. Yes. And if you're a good person, but if a hammer's about to fall, the law of gravity is not going to say, oop, she's a good person. The hammer's, <laughs> the hammer's not going to hit you. Yes. You know, no. It's going to hit you if you're under the hammer. Yes. So the idea is that these are sacred laws. Yes. We want to be in tune with these laws. Oh. And the power of forgiveness, self-forgiveness and forgiveness is a law that changes our life. I, I try to tell people, before you go to bed at night, just run through your day. And if you're holding on any annoyances, any unforgivenesses, somebody said something... Don't go to bed with that. Beautiful. Release it, forgive it, let it go, and go to sleep in an awareness that something wonderful is trying to happen in your life.